I'm honored to introduce two remarkable women who have not only made an impressive contribution in their respective fields, but are also here to guide us through this important discussion. Our guest of honor, Dr. Danigal Goldthwaite Young, is not only an accomplished author, but also holds the position of Distinguished Professor of Communication and Political Science at the University of Delaware. Having also served as a Distinguished Research Fellow at Penn's Annenberg Public Policy Center, Dana brings a wealth of expertise to our gathering. Her latest book, Wrong, How Media, Politics, and Identity Drive Our Appetite for Misinformation, critically examines how American politics and media reinforce partisan views and is the subject of our discussion this evening. Her writing has been featured in the New York Times, The Atlantic, and the Columbia Journalism Review, among many others. And her TED Talk has garnered nearly two million views, all showcasing the wide-reaching influence of her work on shaping the national discourse. Guiding us through this discussion is the award-winning journalist, Cherry Gregg, known to many through her work on WHYY. Throughout her dis distinguished career in journalism, including her decade-long tenure at KYW News Radio, Cherry has been a steadfast advocate for civil rights, social justice, and public affairs issues, particularly those impacting marginalized communities in the Philadelphia region. As a past president of the Philadelphia Association of Black Journalists, Cherry brings not only a deep understanding of media dynamics, but also a unique perspective on the importance of diverse narratives in shaping our collective understanding. Tonight's discussion promises to be a compelling exploration of the connections between media, politics, and identity. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Cherry and Dana to the stage. Over, hello, good evening everyone, how are you? So I'm really excited to be here with you, Dana. Thank you, Cherry. I'm excited that you uh, were willing to do this and super grateful to the library and to Committee of 70 for sponsoring this event. Yes, and so beautiful book cover, big words wrong on the front as the main title. I want to, as we get started in this conversation, Dana, I want to uh, go back to what sort of sparked your interest to, to spend so much time writing about this topic. We know that there has been a whole lot of attention paid to you know, what people describe as the crisis of mis- and disinformation. And you know, there's a lot of research that's being done on sort of the, the ecosystem, the landscape of mis- and disinformation. There are folks studying the spread of mis- and disinformation on social media. And there are also folks studying sort of the psychology of mis- and disinformation, like what causes individuals to believe information that is empirically false. Um, I, as someone who studies media and politics and social science, I see all of these things as interrelated, and I didn't mm -hmm. see any place where all of these layers and dynamics were explained together, where you see how individual social psychology interacts with politics, interacts with media dynamics, media economics, journalism, and so that's what I tried to offer through the book. And good job. Thanks. Um, I've been a journalist for more than a decade at this point. Um, the years have been flying by. And um, the past few years, I have been sort of frustrated, you know, because you're trying to do your job and um, you feel like you're sort of going uphill. This is, there's this uphill battle getting accurate information. Um, to folks. So I want to sort of like lay a foundation a little bit so that because we think we know what we know and then we think, oh, you know, there's this misinformation, but I want to sort of lay the foundation. What exactly is misinformation? Because we've heard these words, misinformation, disinformation, kind of floating around, but I don't think people have actually defined it in their minds. In, you know, the folks who study this, there's confusion with the lexicon even in the discipline itself. So yeah. um, mis and dis, mis and disinformation are related. They both are, they both involve information that you encounter in the world that is empirically false. That you can take some kind of empirical evidence and it, can, it reveals that that information itself mm -hmm. is false. Misinformation is information that is spread by a source that doesn't know that it is false. They're not intentionally trying to deceive. They themselves probably believe that it is true. So I always say, you know, when your Aunt Sally shares something that's false on Facebook, that's probably misinformation, unless she's working for the Kremlin. 
if she is, <laughs> if she's working for the Kremlin, then it's probably disinformation. Mm -hmm. So disinformation is information that's empirically false, but they, the sender knows it to be false, and they are spreading it intentionally to deceive. Um, but what's interesting is that all of the, those terms deal with information that is false in the world. Mm. They don't deal with information that is false in our minds. So what do we do with that? And you know, there are different terms that we use. Sometimes we'll, we'll say, okay, misperceptions mm -hmm. are things that you hold in your mind that are false. Um, you could just call them beliefs, false beliefs. You can even call them knowledge. Now let's think about that, because for some of us, what we know may be false. So how do we, I mean, it, there are many sort of epistemological questions that this invites us to ask, right? So what is the difference between fact and opinion? What's the difference between knowledge and belief? People have been writing about this for centuries. Um, but I, I'd like to make that um, distinction between false information in the world and the uh, beliefs that we hold in our mind that are themselves empirically false. Yeah, and I think about all the, anybody here have superstitious people in their families? <laughs> Don't step on the cracks. You know the, you know the rest of that. But there's so many things that we think we know. And sometimes mm -hmm. information is sort of passed through generations. It may not be correct. And we just believe it. And there's, you, you lay out a framework about how we take in information and it becomes things that we believe that we know. So break that down for us. So, so I, I love the idea that really people come to truth through two main ways, through observations of the world, but also through the values, theories, and beliefs that we hold in our mind. So we think about things and we come to conclusions internally, or we, or we make observations of the world and we update the things that we know. The issue is, though, when we make those observations of the mm -hmm. world outside us, we're not doing so in a neutral way. We're not objective observers. We're not like in a vacuum. Um, so we actually, the values, theories, and beliefs that we hold in our mind serve as a lens through which we see the world. We are not neutral observers. So philosophers of science have, have called this, you know, the theory-ladenness of observation, right? But what I argue in the book is that when social identity is very salient, when we are a member of a team and we think of ourselves as a member of a team, the values, theories, and beliefs that we hold in our minds are so informed by our social identity mm -hmm. that our social identity shapes what we see. And there's extensive research illustrating how that works. So our observations are not only theory-laden, they are also identity-laden. And give an example, because sure. people might, those words, so we, we could be walking on the street and see two different things because yes. maybe we have two backgrounds. So sure. give an example. Well, yeah. the, the example that I give in the book, and because they're both me, is that I am, I'm from New Hampshire, and I'm from a rural area, and, but I also now live outside of Philadelphia, and I think of myself as a progressive who's environmentally minded, right? But in New Hampshire... When I am back home in New Hampshire, there are wind turbines that are on the top of the mountains. Giant, giant windmills. The folks, most of the folks who live there really do not like them. They think that they're eyesores. They, they ruin the natural beauty. Mm -hmm. They could harm tourism, etc. When I am there and I am thinking of myself as a New Hampshireite, as a granite stater, which is what we call ourselves, uh, I really don't like them. Like, I feel like they look industrial and dirty and off-putting. But when I think about them when I'm here, I think of them as green energy and progress and clean air. Mm. Like, literally, how I perceive them changes depending upon what hat I'm wearing. And we all do this all the time. Um, there, there are some wonderful experiments by Jay Van Bavel at NYU and his colleagues where they manipulate which identity people have in their minds, and it changes how, they, how food tastes to them. It changes how things sound, how things smell, because observations are identity-laden. And it's so interesting, we, and that sort of goes to the next um, topic of conversation, because that can explain, in a lot of ways, how somebody who is perfectly intelligent, smart, doing a, a lot of great things in life can take on and start believing some misinformation um, and, and act as though they know this thing. And you actually mm -hmm. use yourself in the beginning of the book and 
admit that at one point in life, you yourself had mm -hmm. been a conspiracy theorist. Yeah. I mean, how is that? How is that so? So one of the things that I think is important is that people believe fictions because at that moment they need to. People embrace fictions because they, they feel that they need to. Mm -hmm. And um, those needs could be, they feel the need to feel like they understand what's going on. They feel the need to feel like they have some agency or control, or they feel the need to have community or be connected with others who share similar beliefs. Um, so when COVID happened, mm -hmm. I was getting a lot of messages on Facebook and emails from friends and family about you know the origins of COVID. What do I think of this story? What, what do you think about this account? Could it be that there was a leak? Could it be that it was a weapon? Could it be that Fauci was in on it, et cetera? And a, a, mm. a documentary came out that you may have seen, many of you probably saw it, called like Plandemic or something. And it had um, a discredited scientist, a doctor, making all these accusations mm -hmm. about COVID. And what I found was that the people who were sharing these ideas with me were actually saying, what do we think of this? Is this how we are going to understand COVID? Mm -hmm. They were checking in with their sort of social team to understand. Mm -hmm. um, but they were, they were inclined, they wanted to believe some of these things because a lot of the misinformation around COVID made it such that you could feel safer, yeah. right? If it's not real, then you're safe. Or if it's something that's deliberately spread, then you can identify who started it and you can fix it. So a lot of these, these misperceptions were about control. And I started digging and researching and started making connections to my own story, yeah. which is that in 2005 and 2006, my late husband was hospitalized and he had multiple surgeries for a brain tumor. And he passed away in July of 2006. But when he was first diagnosed and for, the, for those first couple of months in the fall of 2005, maybe it was about four or five weeks, I felt so out of control yeah. with this diagnosis that I was all over the internet finding accounts for where did this tumor come from why is it here? Is it possible mm. that there is some environmental cause? Is it possible that um, after he had his first treatment, and then there, you know, it's very common that after a first surgery it'll grow back, then the conspiracy theories were, okay, well, were, was there malpractice? Is it possible that they didn't do the right mm. thing? Did we get bad advice? And what I learned was that this, it is very, very common for folks who feel completely out of control and that they have no control in their situation to grasp onto conspiracy theories because conspiracy theories give you a target to mm. be angry at. And anger, as much as this seems counterintuitive, anger is actually an emotion that gives you some hope mm -hmm. and motivation and direction. And I think people forget that. I mean, we know in the political psychology literature that the reason that a lot of political ads try to make people mad yeah. uh, is because anger is motivating. Anger motivates action. And so social psychologists have found that when people feel angry, they feel a lot more optimistic mm. than when they feel fearful or anxious, which makes intuitive sense, but mm -hmm. it also explains why when you feel completely out of control, a conspiracy theory that has a target and someone to be mad at offers you some semblance of not just control, but also optimism. It's misplaced, it's misguided, but it offers you that. And I think about the COVID pandemic, um, and sort of all the misinformation that I was taking in as a journalist and we were constantly fact checking things and doing stories and trying to explain things. And then of course there was a social unrest, even more misinformation yeah. um, that we had to tackle. And um, you know, I, I think about why that time, given what you just said, was the perfect breeding ground yeah. for mass mass conspiracy theories, mass belief of conspiracy theories. And can you talk about this time? Because it seemed like, because for years, conspiracy theories have been around. 
but not on the, it didn't feel like it was on this massive scale. Did it feel like it shifted because of this time? Yeah, so, so we do know that conspiracy theories have been around forever. In fact, there are some accounts um, about the, the reason that conspiracy theories exist. One account by a psychologist, Michael Bang Peterson, is that um, groups create conspiracy theories about hostile coalitions, like enemy outgroups, that may exist in the shadows, and they do it for the reason, for, to, to motivate the in-group towards action. It solves what they call the collective action problem. Like, but if there is an out-group and they're doing something you know, that's secret and shady, we have to take action to protect ourselves. Um, so they've been around for centuries. What we know is that when people are in, under conditions of stress and anxiety, which mm. COVID was very stressful and people had a lot of anxiety, um, and when people are socially isolated, when people See? feel mm -hmm. lonely, one of the predictors of belief in conspiracy theories is also a, a social distrust if you do not trust other people or other individuals, you will tend to be more, more likely to embrace conspiracy theories. And I think, about, I think that that's an interesting fact given how we were seeing other people as the potential spreaders of a deadly virus mm. during COVID. Also, the simple fact that when people were alone and they were looking for community, they were doing it on social media because we weren't allowed to be together. And so a lot of communities formed around shared beliefs mm. through Facebook pages and Facebook groups. So we saw, we saw that as sort of um, a, a lexus of, of where that came together. And then you think about uh, you know, tel media, right? Being very partisan, mm -hmm. um, how COVID became political. And it, it almost felt like the politicians were using this issue to sort of get people riled up. And so can we talk about the, the use of politics to divide people and making an issue that shouldn't be political, um, very political, and sort of how it exacerbated this mass conspiracy adoption? What, I think this is probably what is most, um, was sort of most disheartening for researchers in this space. Um, my colleague Amy Blakely and I created um, a, a sort of theoretical model that we thought really would account for how conspiracy theory beliefs related mm. to COVID could be, you know, remedied by local health communication practitioners and public health experts. That if there were regulations and if there were mandates put in place and if our local public health folks were to, you know, issue certain rules or recommendations or guidelines, it could kind of disrupt some of this mm -hmm. political division. Unfortunately, what we found was that the the political divisions were so profound mm -hmm. and whether or not you were a, a masker or an anti-masker, or a vac vaxxer or an anti-vaxxer, those became not just policy beliefs, but they became tied to people's social identities. And they became tied to these political mega identities, which are sort of at the heart of mm -hmm. the book, right? That there are, on the left and the right in the United States, for various reasons we can discuss, there are these two umbrellas that have come to envelop these giant overarching social identities, which aren't just about policy positions, but they're about different kinds of people who mm -hmm. value different kinds of things. And that, you know, it is very clear that, especially the, the language of Donald Trump, about masking, about vaccines, which for that one, he tried to thread the needle yes. multiple different ways on the vaccine issue. Um, but it became clear that the, the damage was done and that base, still remains significantly less likely to be vaccinated and has significantly higher death rates. And when you look at counties where Trump won in 2020, you see these disproportionate death rates as a function of, um, of that, the voter turnout in those places. Yeah, and it was interesting because rural people less likely to be vaccinated than people who lived in cities. Mm -hmm. And the people who got sick, it was sort of, you know, shift based on these identities. And that identity was sort of tied to geography. Yeah. 
and then it was tied to political um, affiliation. And so um, there was so much going on, and I feel like the, the health professionals changing messages led to more distrust. Um, I want to talk about now how journalism, social media, you know, this messaging all sort of added to that. And I want to start with journalism. How did we do? Like, how did we make it worse? Did we make it worse? I yeah. feel like we did. So I, I want to take a step back because the role of social identity is so huge. Mm -hmm. And just to understand how social identity works in the U.S. context, to understand how journalists, even, even yeah. the good ones, Cherry, journalists <laughs> can inadvertently prime social identity in ways that can be divisive and mm -hmm. cause people to be more likely to believe misinformation. So here, here's the issue. When you look at what has happened in the United States over the past 40 years, our political parties have come to uh, encapsulate not just people with these different policy positions, as I said, but different kinds of people. So in part in the 1960s and 70s, due to the, par mm -hmm. the partisan racial realignment of the parties, you had, you know, really blacks from the South migrating north and west to cities and really forcing the hand of dem hands of Democrats in those cities to prioritize civil rights. The shift in the party structure was really because for decades there had been a compromise on race and, race and civil rights uh, among what are now Democrats. So with that racial realignment, then there was a question on the part of the Republican Party with these folks now leaving the party, we are, how are we going to establish mm -hmm. legislative success? And there was a deliberate effort in the 1970s to court evangelicals and to do so through an appeal that was actually a racial appeal. I talk in the book a bit about the, the sort of unity of race and religious motivations through the 1970s, the establishment of the Heritage Foundation, the mm -hmm. conservative think tank, really, and, and it started because there were white parents who felt frustrated that their children who were going to Christian schools were going to not be, not that they weren't going to be allowed to do so, but the, the school's tax exempt status was being revoked by the Nixon administration for violating these anti-segregation laws because they were de facto segregated schools, right? So what happens is that this becomes a, and we talked about how anger is a mobilizing emotion. Mm -hmm. Well, there were people who recognized this as an opportunity to mobilize white evangelicals who were also m motivated by the sort of underlying premise which was about racial segregation. And that really created this shift in this movement. So when you look at the shift in the parties in terms of their composition, what you have over the last 40 years is different kinds of people sorting themselves into the two parties. So now you have a Democratic Party, which is racial and ethnically diverse, has folks who live in suburban and urban communities, um, is more culturally liberal, um, and tends to be secular and agnostic. And you have a Republican Party that is overwhelmingly white, evangelical, rural, and culturally conservative. So because of the way social identity works, mm -hmm. when we are on a team and we feel like we're in a member of a team where everyone looks like me, acts like me, lives like me, and worships like me, it makes social identity super salient and it makes us very easy to ignite in terms of our anger and our perception of outgroup threat. And so when we look at the asymmetry of the way that misinformation and disinformation spreads on the right and the left, especially over the last 10 years, my, my suggestion is that this is very much driven by the homogenous social identity on the right. All of that is- And I wanna yeah. ask you a quick follow-up yeah. question yeah. because one of the things you talk about in the book is this injection of intuition oh, yeah, yeah. over yeah. facts. And when you start having yeah. an identity that is in alignment with a religion, yep. and religion allows you some space, right? Yeah. To, to, to use your intuition, to inject That's beliefs right. that may not be factually based. And that has sort of had, its, had it a run within the right 
in, in, in a lot of ways that has sort yeah. of led to you know, more mass acceptance of conspiracy theories. And I think that a lot of what we see in terms of these asymmetries um, is about the, what I call sort of the epistemology of evangelicalism. So what does that mean? Mm -hmm. It's about how do evangelical Christians come to truth. And by the way, this is not a judgment in terms of what is good and bad. It simply is a statement of what do we know based on the data happens when you come to truth certain ways. And you know, I did a study with my colleagues looking at who is more likely to believe in mm -hmm. mis and disinformation, um, people who value intuition and their gut as pathways to truth, or people who value evidence and data as pathways to truth. Mm -hmm. And the answer is, the people who are more likely to believe mis and disinformation are those who are guided by intuition and their gut. Intuitionists are more likely to be, to score high in religiosity and especially evangelicalism. These are also the same people who show overwhelming support, not just in the US, but elsewhere, for authoritarian populists, mm -hmm. which I think is crucial because when in our research, we looked at whether or not there are correlations between coming to truth through intuition and republicanism, coming to truth through intuition and conservatism. And yeah, those relationships were there, but they're a little weaker. But when we look at support or, or coming to truth through intuition and support for Trump, that relationship is is significant and substantive. Um, so for, for us, you know, in looking at this, there, there clearly is a relationship here. Mm -hmm. And political scientists Oliver and Wood have documented how, and they contend yeah. that it is the sort of shift from, of evangelical Christians into the Republican Party that is responsible for this this epistemological divide between the parties. They argue that that is the most pronounced divide of all. That coming, how we come to truth, how we come to know what mm. we know, if we differ on that, that that is the biggest divide of all. And when you look at how now religion maps onto political beliefs in the United States and political party, this, it's not a great combo. And I'll also just say, folks who study democratic health around the globe, they'll say, what you don't want in a healthy democracy is for your political parties to capture other dimensions that are sort of primally related to identity. Mm -hmm. You don't want political parties that also capture religious differences, mm -hmm. racial differences, or ethnic differences. That's not good. What you want are political parties that capture policy differences and ideological differences. Um, otherwise, you're going to run into what we have now, yeah. which is these identity-driven in-group, out-group um, skirmishes. It was interesting when I was in graduate school um, at Temple, they, um, we had the head of Fox News come in and speak to all the students. And um, they were talking, we were talking about the history and the rise of Fox News and sort of how it wasn't really news. They were more like commentators, um, but presented things in the form of news and sort of the rise of partisan journalism. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the next, because when you start, when you have people who um, have these very strong identities, they're tied, they're, it's racial divides, you have religious divides, and then you also have divides based on the type of media you take in, that makes it even worse. So now I feel like, how did journalism or media, mass media, impact this mass acceptance of conspiracy theory? Well, so, so number one, you can imagine that in a culture where political parties are overlapping with these other sort of primal divisions, it's really good for media systems whose economics are based on market segmentation, right? That's what cable television is, mm -hmm. that's what the internet is. It's about finding tiny homogenous audiences that you can sell to advertisers. So there's a real synergy there mm -hmm. between the state of our current political environment and the economics of our media systems, number one. Um, when it comes to journalism, like when you're thinking about mainstream journalism, some of the ways that journalism exacerbate these issues are, uh, first we know that there is a tendency 
for journalists to emphasize, nationalize culture war issues. Those are the issues that get a lot of attention, things that have to do with uh, race, sexuality, uh, crime, immigration. Mm -hmm. Those are kind of the hot button issues and those are discussed sort of at the national level at 30,000 feet. The other issue here is that the folks who are representing the parties know that if they perform their identity as sort of the group prototype for their party by highlighting out group threat and waving their flag of identity within their party super high and acting outrageously, they will be rewarded with press coverage, right? And, and it works. And I have, I have you know, some evidence in, in the book about how that works. Um, and finally, I think the journalists focus on conflict, which is an understandable mm -hmm. norm, right? Harmony isn't news, conflict is news. But when our parties are capturing these other kinds of divisions, that tendency or that norm to cover conflict is necessarily going to reinforce those divides. So folks who are consuming journalism, who are reminded of culture war issues, who are seeing these extreme prototypes from the party perform these outrageous gestures, you know. I always say when I'm talking about the book, there is really no reason for all of us in this room to know who Marjorie Taylor Greene is. Right? I mean, Absolutely there not. really is not. There is no reason. And yet we do. And why? Because she is rewarded regularly for outrageous behaviors on the fringes, and she's rewarded with press coverage and time. And not just, not just by Fox. Mm -hmm. She's rewarded by MSNBC because as she CNN, performs yeah. outgroup threat, there it is, right? And she's rewarded by mainstream journalists as well. So, so th I think if reconsidering some of those norms could be, could be helpful. And then of course we have social media, mm -hmm. And, and I want to take some moments um, to talk about solutions a bit, and then we're going to open it up to the audience, because I know you have questions. Yes? I see a couple heads nodding. Um, because it sounds very daunting, Dana. I mean, you know, we, you know, we were very confused, I think, during the 2020 election on how to cover you know, sure. threats to democracy sure. on, you know, to move away from the horse race and the music that makes your heart skip a beat. It's like, dun, dun, dun. Mm -hmm. You know, like it was, because we've been doing this horse race version of yeah. covering politics for decades. Mm -hmm. And so what do we do? How do we fix this? How do we mm -hmm. call people in and sh shift this tide of folks just believing all this misinformation? So in the, the final, so the, the book kind of wrote itself until the final chapter of solutions. And this one took you a while. And you that took this. me a really long time. Um, <laughs> so, but hopefully, hopefully there are some tangible things here that can help us all. So uh, of course there are systemic changes, the kinds of sy systemic changes that organizations like the Committee of 70 works towards all the time. Things like campaign finance reform, right? Because money in politics is part of what is driving a lot of this, this divisiveness um, so that's one. Um, obviously, looking at ways to stop partisan gerrymandering because mm -hmm. the more the more districts are ideologically or, or you know homogenous in terms of their party, it worsens how these processes play out, especially during primaries. So, at the systemic level, there are things that can be done. But for us, first for journalists. Um, I was part of a group that, of scholars that made recommendations for democracy-centered reporting during the 2020 election. And I, I really feel that the guidelines that we provided were super helpful, and I know that journalists responded really well to them. Um, democracy-centered democracy reporting means always thinking, what is the story that's going to help democracy, and how can I tell this story in a way that's going to improve democratic health? And once the, uh, the job of journalism is viewed through that lens, norms will change. It means not necessarily cov covering strategy in the horse race in the same mm -hmm. way. It means covering processes and institutions. It means spending time covering your local um, election workers, how it's done, explaining to voters, here is mm -hmm. how your votes are counted. When there is transparency, there is a lot more faith and trust in the system. Um, also, avoiding that sort, those nationalized culture war issues through the lens of right versus left. 
really talking substantively about what public policies are being debated and what options are and what they look like. Um, the other two avenues for recommendations, one for social media and one for us. So for social media, the call is the same as it's been for years, mm -hmm. but they have yet to deliver. And that call is make data available to researchers without tying our hands. And number two. Because we have no idea. We have no idea. How the algorithm, algorithms work. Right. How information is fed to you. They Correct. won't tell us. They won't tell us. Yeah. And also make information available about the algorithm to enable counter speech to be able to be placed in people's Facebook feeds or, or news feeds. Because currently there is no way to issue counter speech because we don't know why individuals see the content that they do. Now, for individuals, that's us. There are many things we can do. The first one, which I love, is called intellectual humility, which is simply being open to the possibility we might be wrong. This is a very mm -hmm. hard thing to do. It's a very hard <laughs> thing to practice, especially when you have teenage children. However, <laughs> being open to the possibility you might be wrong simply means you are always not just willing to update your view, but you're always going through the world looking for opportunities to update your view. Is there evidence that may contradict what you believe? Rather than being ego and identity driven as you encounter the world, like that's how we usually do things, folks, is we are defensive, we encounter the world wearing our identity as a shield, and we're trying to deflect and say, no, that's not true, that's not true, that contradicts, that contradicts. What about being at what's called an actively open-minded thinker, we are open to the possibility you might be wrong at all times. The other things that we can do, because social identity is so much of what is driving the divisiveness in American politics especially, and our belief in misinformation, finding ways to reshuffle the deck and always give the benefit of the doubt. And here's why. Even though individuals from different religious groups and ethnic groups and, and geographic regions have sorted into the two parties, the reality of Americans' public policy positions is way more nuanced than any of those dynamics would ever suggest. When you actually start asking people their positions, even on issues that are as provocative and, and salient as mm. abortion and gun rights, you find that there is a lot more nuance than party labels would suggest. So that means always get, giving the benefit of the doubt. And part of that, part of our reshuffling the deck is about how we perform our own identities. I guarantee that everyone in this room has felt some reluctance to be super forthcoming in their views about certain issues because they feel that they might be, they might get a hand slap from other members of their team, mm. okay? Now imagine if instead of being nervous about that, in the interest of democratic health, you were more forthcoming in the nuanced and you know, complexities of your issue positions. That you, when you're on social media, instead of being quiet on those issues where you don't really fit with your team, you are very open about the ways in which you might not fit with your team. Doing so in a way that's civil and matter of fact, but if we all did that, do you realize that would change the nature of the information environment online? Because the people who are most likely to post online tend to be the most extreme in their views, mm -hmm. tend to be those people who are the sort of stereotypical prototypes. So we owe it to ourselves and to democracy to reshuffle that deck by being honest in our views. And I have a quick quote that I wanted to read. It says that you wrote. Oh. Yes. It says, being wrong isn't about believing factually inaccurate pieces of information. It's not even about believing lies people tell us. It's about our psychological needs, the need to understand our world, have agency within it, and feel socially connected to people. So. Part of what you're saying, it seems to me, is that we need to be more open-minded, but I also want to talk about ways that we can call people in mm -hmm. versus calling people out. I've heard that phrase, and we have people, I have people in my family, people I know, who I'm like, really? That, that is so inaccurate, <laughs> that wrong information? But there's ways of going about it. 
Right. Um, and I told you I DM. I'm like the social media police. Um, if people post misinformation, I don't argue with them. I message them or text them quietly and tell them why they may need to take something down. Are there other ways? Because I want to give people kind of like a little bit of a call to action when they so see this. What I love, when Sherry uh, shared this with me earlier, I said, you're actually, that is what the research suggests you should do. Because by going behind the scenes and direct messaging the, the friend or loved one, or by texting them and saying, hey, I saw that thing you posted. I just want you to know it looks like that's, that's probably not true. Here is some disconfirming information. By doing that, you show that you respect them enough to not call them out in front of everyone. And, but you care enough about them having the accurate information to reach out in the first place. It also solidifies that connection in a way that's one-to-one, -one, right? There's love and affection there. Mm -hmm. That is the way to do it. And for all of us have friends who are high and mighty and like to make fun of the people who hold these crazy beliefs. But I'll tell you, given that folks who believe in conspiracy theories or things even like QAnon, are more likely to distrust other people and to feel like they are social outcasts, mocking folks like this is certainly not going to move the ball forward. So like you talked about calling them in, um, I, I have given advice before that if you are going to see folks around the holidays and they share, they, they, they hold some kind of beliefs that we know to be demonstrably false, rather than making fun or calling them out or saying, how can you be so stupid? That's not going to help, <laughs> OK? Um, really, getting away from that identity altogether, because it really is identity driven, and reminding them of things like your shared history together, mm. if they're family members, reminding them of holidays past, the time that you went fishing or camping. Remember that funny thing that grandma did back in 1974? Mm -hmm. uh, reminding them of relationships outside of that community and reminding them that they are respected because by giving them this time and energy and affection, there's a connection there and they feel your love and respect. So it's weird because it's like, it's like not ta talking about the elephant in the room, but that's the whole point. What we're trying to do is dilute these identities and the way that you do that is not talking about the identity. We don't talk about Bruno, Cherry. I love it. <laughs> we, we don't talk about these identities. But you, 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 know, you diversify them by having them think about themselves in other terms. Mm -hmm. And then maybe they'll listen. Maybe they'll listen. I appreciate you being here. Unfortunately, you probably know me by now. I talked way too much. I'll try to pick the one subject, although there's about 20. Um, just picking one, there's 20. Um, our mayor-elect wants, I, you know, I, see, this is where I, my viewpoint is, you want to understand a person's motivation. So the mayor-elect wants to reduce crime in the city. I'm all for that. But she's convinced that stop and frisk, reinstituting that, will be that will fix everything. And I don't really think it's going to work. But again, that's the thing where, like, I don't think it's misinformation, disinformation. She legitimately wants to reduce crime. It's not like she's trying to have Putin win or something. But then also, I don't know if, but again, I don't know what, she said, well, what do you suggest? If, if soft and frisk doesn't work, we need to do something to reduce crime. You know, again, she wants some answer. And so I would agree with her. We need something concrete we could tell her. But I don't know if the thing is, how would we deal with real situations like that? So, so the, the question is, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, the new mayor really is thinking of, of reinstituting stop and frisk, and is that going to reduce crime? You are of the opinion that it probably will not. This is what I, why a, a shared understanding mm -hmm. of facts is so important. Yes. Because in order to establish public policy, first, there has to be some concrete way of assessing what the conditions are on the ground that mm -hmm. are being tackled. So what this would require, obviously, is looking at data across various cities to understand how has stop and frisk worked? Are, are there conditions under which it does reduce crime? Are there conditions under which it does not? Does it have other negative consequences that may be mm -hmm. unanticipated, but because it's been used in other cities, we could study those? When there is empirical data, because folks and, and other you know, pol police departments mm -hmm. have, have mm -hmm. tracked this, then there's a way of looking to empirical evidence to inform policy. So I don't know what the answer is. I have no yeah. idea. But there, I am sure, is empirical data that could speak to it. Yeah. And quick, and quick follow up. I, I wonder this, and this sort of piggybacks on what you asked. There's a lot of 
I guess, um, misuse of language, yeah. um, even using stop and frisk to describe both the illegal use of it and the legal use of it. And so because they've been sort of combined as one thing, people can be talking about two different things using the same language. Yeah. And I think yeah. there's a lot of confusion about a lot of different tools that are in the tool toolbox, so to speak, because yeah. And, yeah. and precision of language is so important, mm -hmm. especially when we're talking about policy, because those are two completely different things. Mm -hmm. um, and we also, as you are listening to debates about mm -hmm. policies like this, for example, you also have to really have your ear out for uh, strategic use of language mm -hmm. and other kinds of framing devices that might be used to cause you to come to certain kinds of conclusions about whether or not a policy is good or bad. And, and just trying to get underneath the hood to figure out what is the policy actually. Yes. And I, I think about defund the police and how that language was like Correct. causing all sorts of problems. And then you have to dig and see what it actually is. And so I, 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 I think that the misinformation point that you talked about yeah. and how people can use language to cause confusion yeah. is key. Yeah. yeah. I, it's interesting because the, you know, calls to defund the police, mm -hmm. that is an interesting one because then that was used as a weapon, right, by mm -hmm. people who were critical to fire, up, you know, to fire yeah. people up. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I think a precision of language is important when, when we're talking about policy, so demanding some kind of precision of language, and empirical evidence to say, okay, so what do we know about what will happen if this policy is implemented? Is there empirical evidence that speaks to that? Um, I want to say thank you for, um, it's great to have live intelligent people talking about important issues, so um, I'm glad I'm here tonight. Great. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to say it, it's, um, I've noticed in the, in the past little while I've, I've seen at least two books that sort of are, are, are dealing with the differences of people. Um, one is called Minding the Climate, and the question is why, do, why are we not paying attention to this huge thing that's coming towards us, mm -hmm. getting faster every day? Uh, and the other one was, and I'm forgetting the name of it, but it, but it has to do with uh, endorphins and chemicals in your body. They, they both, bo boil, both boil down to, and I think you, your book sort of does too, there's two kinds of people. There's this kind of people, and there's that kind of people. You know, either from a social standpoint, which is where you're, um, or an identity standpoint, or from a physical standpoint, this is how the chemicals in your body work. And, or, and from an evolutionary standpoint, we don't... We don't look at long problems. We only see short-range things because I'm hungry today. I'm not mm -hmm. worried about, you know, a, yeah. a year from now. Um, uh, so I, I didn't really have any, any question other than is, it, is what you're saying there's two kinds of people. There's ones that do this and the ones that do that. And so I, of course, think I'm on the right side of this. Um, but you could be wrong. But I could be wrong <laughs> I'll, I'll, about some things, maybe not everything. But it seems like probably most people are on the right side of, 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 of the issue and saying, of course we need to believe that facts are true and that some facts are just facts. They're not opinions, they're just there's reality. Um, is that what you're saying? Is that there are just two kinds of people? Well, I think that you know, when, you're, when you're trying to summarize concepts in ways that are really accessible. You can boil it down like that and oversimplify it, so yes. However, in actuality, it is not that simple. Everything's mm -hmm. on a spectrum. And in fact, what we know about, and, and this, this really blew my mind, when, when we were studying the relationship between um, intuitionism and belief in misinformation, for example, you know, we had two different scales. We, one scale measured, had a bunch of different questions asking people to what extent they you know, used intuition or their gut to come to truth. The other scale assessed the extent to which they used evidence and data to come to truth. Those two scales are not polar opposites of the same thing. Mm. They are positively correlated with one another. So our, our sense is that people who score high on both of these are those people who are more likely to think about how they think, right? Because that's what you're asking people to do. Think about how you think. Okay. So we, what we did was we looked at them in terms of quadrants, really, because there's a huge spectrum. 
And it is the case, though, that when you get to the ends of people who really, really, really believe in evidence and data and really don't value intuition very much, and on the other side, the people who really value intuition and don't really care about evidence and data, there is where you find a lot of these dynamics that we're talking about. But it doesn't operate as an either or. It is always sort of a spectrum. And most of us are in the middle. Yeah. Just in the big pile, in the normal curve. How do you see the impact of uh, generative artificial intelligence um, affecting these tendencies in political society? That's a good one right there. Yeah. yeah yes, not, not great. <laughs> it's not great. I'll say that. So what concerns me, let me just tell a quick little ditty, and that is, you know, I've been teaching the Introduction to Media and Society course at the University of Delaware for 16 years, which is weird because I'm, what, 20? <laughs> <laughs> you laugh too hard, sir. Um, <laughs> Um, and, you know, as I teach that class and I talk about media effects and media impact, uh, I always ask my students to just think for a second, what if, we, what if we all just disappeared? Like, imagine that there was a rapture, but it took all of us, <laughs> the rest of us. What would aliens say if they landed on Earth mm. and the only thing that they had to understand us by were our media products? And I tend to hear things like, oh, <laughs> oh, not good. So now the issue that I have with generative AI is that all of those media products that the aliens would use to come to the conclusion that we are a violent, nasty, negative lot, all of those media products are being used to inform all of the outputs of these models. That freaks me out, right? Mm -hmm. When you think about what is going, you know, these large language models, they're not out of nowhere, right? They include the narratives, the biases, the stereotypes, the, you know, everything that we are and have created is what is informing them. Mm -hmm. um, I also, I'm super concerned because the people who are working on developing these technologies have tried to blow the whistle many times about how destructive they could be. Uh, and because nobody wants to get scooped by some company from another country, they still are at it. So mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not, I don't, it's not good. Yeah, that's my, that's my take. Hi, um, thank you. I like how you connected like the identity to the seeking of information. It was one of the things that I um, uh, wanted to ask you about in terms of just um, the the propensity of people to seek out like what we call an informational bias, you know, and which connects to what your research is um, about, but. Even if we have an in, like an informational bias, I think most people, um, even even if they question the information that they're leaning toward, or you know they're going toward their gut or whatever, um, finding out what really true facts are is very very difficult. And I think true. most people are I don't want to say lazy, but you know, they're just not up to the task. And, mm -hmm. and, that, and I, I would think, you know, for many things, it's a huge task um, to really kind of weed out what, what is the truth? Yeah. And where are we getting it from? Because, you know, we do tend to lean toward what we want to believe, you know, or where our informational bias lies. And then I have another part to this. Um, it is also an historical, um, like an historical amnesia as to what has happened or what is happening now to what has happened in the past. And I'm not talking really remote past in terms of societal disruption and informational bias and mis and disinformation that has, you know, occurred throughout the history, you know, during World War II, during, you know, the Vietnam War, you know, we've, we've had this happen before, but people forget. Why do people forget that this has happened before? And we can't look back 
and say, you know what, we've been through this before. Let's let's figure it out. You know, let's yeah. uncover. And uh, the third thing, <laughs> the third thing is, is that we, you know, we worry. You know, like we're worried a lot about like a lot of leftist, your left thinking type of you know things, and we we kind of don't kind of really historically call out, you know, the right side, you know, where we're like, and I'm not saying, and I don't like to sweep a broad, I, I definitely do not like to sweep a broad paintbrush across everything because, like you said, the nuances, and not everybody is completely wrong and not everybody's completely right, you know, and there's a lot of good people that think differently than me, and I don't want to think badly of them because they're not in my So, just, So that last question, could you just summarize that last question? Wait, which one? <laughs> and I wrote down, there was three parts. One was, how do we get the correct information? I got that one. Number two, the historical, historical amnesia. amnesia. Got it. And number three, how there tends to be call-outs on the left side, but not necessarily on the right side. Or okay, so let me, the, I don't know if I can take on all those, but let me definitely take on the first one. Because, you know, the question, how do you find out what's true? Um, you know, we are, when, when you talked about how, I don't want to say we're lazy, but yeah, okay, but, that, but here's the deal. We cannot be scrutinizing everything all the time or we wouldn't leave our homes in the morning, okay? We operate based on sort of this low information rationality, which is we do the best we can with what we've got. And it works pretty well most of the time. So these things called heuristics, these cognitive shortcuts that we use, they help guide us all the time. And they usually guide us in the right direction, right? They just do. They don't always, and they can result in some problems. But wh what I think is interesting is that even emotions and emotional responses, emotion, thinking of emotion as a form of cognition, I think is useful because even emotions are information. When we feel fearful, that's signaling information to us that we need to take some kind of action. When we feel angry, that's signaling something. The problem is not in us. And this is where I'm like, I keep landing. The, we, we are not the problem. Everyone th wants to think that we are the problem. We're not the problem. The problem is that the, these patterns evolved Dur during you know you know centuries when we existed in what's called a benign information environment, mm. right? So you think about how the psychophysiological systems evolved in an environment where you know by and large information stimuli could be taken at face value for what they were, right? We now experience the world in a mediated form, mediated forms of information have been curated and strategically constructed to get us to feel certain things. And now, I've, I would say, especially now, we live in a malignant information environment mm. where all of the signals that are around us, all of the stimuli are created to make us feel things and make us do things. And so the problem isn't that we can't trust our own responses. The problem is that the information environment that's triggering those responses is a hostile one. That's what I would say. Hi, Dana. Good to Hi, see John. you. Hi, John. Good to see you. Uh, John Sands, Knight Foundation. Um, one thing that you, your book does really well, I think, is, is, um, is capture the scientific consensus on a number of different you know, in a number of different areas in a, in a way that's super accessible. So I encourage everybody to, to buy the book, give it as gifts, it's amazing. But, the, <laughs> but uh, I wondered if you would talk a little bit about areas of kind of emerging scientific consensus or areas where we don't know enough yet to begin having, you know, serious policy conversations. Um, you know, an emerging area, for instance, might be exposure. What, what, are, what's, what do some of the data say about exposure, the effects of exposure to mis and disinformation, yeah, no, et cetera? That's, that's great. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's, you're absolutely right. I mean, one of the things that we wrestle with is, you know, researchers will find, oh, here are all the people who have been exposed to this huge amount of mis- or disinformation, and it's asymmetrical. Mm. And look, it's all, it's, Republicans are more likely to be exposed to this content than, than liberals. But just because someone's exposed doesn't mean they end up believing it. And a lot of the, the, issues that, that we're kind of struggling with, and the one that I find most interesting, truly, is 
what do we do with the question mark of, is it that algorithms are radicalizing people, or is it that people kind of want to be radicalized? Mm. And that's the big one to me. I mean, that's one of those areas where I talk about it a bit in the book that there's co sort of competing views. And how do you empirically study that, right? How do you, you know, when are you ever going to get to the bottom of the fact that, well, this person has these latent kind of propensities that they're really looking to fertilize? Mm. And because of the things that they're looking at, sure, they get some recommendations here or there, but really they kind of want it. The, those are the areas where I think it's really uncomfortable for us. And it's unco uncomfortable for us as scholars because I don't know that anyone really wants to wrestle with the fact that there are individuals who look like everyone else, but mm -hmm. who kind of want to go down these paths. That, that's one issue. Uh, th there are many others. I mean, quite frankly, the big issue for me as a media scholar is our media environment is getting so unwieldy, it is almost impossible to study the effects of exposure um, without working with or for one of these giant mega corporations that owns the platforms or whatever, and I, I personally am not willing to do that. Um, many people do, but in order to really get access to the kind of data that you need to be able to answer these questions, uh, the entities that have a lot at stake based on the answer to these questions mm -hmm. make it very difficult to answer them. Wow. Yeah. Um, thank you for the questions um, from the audience. And I want to give you one final question as we close up tonight, because 2024 is coming. Yeah. Um, anybody else concerned and thinking about it? Um, <laughs> exactly. It's coming, and it's coming fast. We're still shell-shocked from 2020. We're still shell-shocked from January 6th. What should we be thinking about? And what should, I guess, the powers that be, the different mm -hmm. categories you talked about, media, social media, mm -hmm. what should we be talking about and thinking about as we shore ourselves up and get ready for what we know will be an onslaught of misinformation coming up in just a few weeks? Something that I think is crucial as you engage with folks in your lives, um, there are folks who... You know, I'm not sure, do they, do they really believe that the 2020 election was stolen? Are they telling themselves that because they want to believe that? We'll never really know, okay? And it's, at some level, it doesn't matter. Um, how do we approach these people and how do we deal with them as we head into 2024? One thing that really concerns me is conflating the sort of cynical and exploitative rhetoric of elites with the hearts and minds of regular people. Mm. There are people who are just trying to get through the day and figure out what's the right thing to do. And if we approach folks with respect and have conversations with them about what's at stake and what, what that looks like, I think that we'll have a much better time sort of making some headway with those folks. And you know, I don't know if you ca caught any of the January 6th committee hearings. Um, with um, Liz Cheney, mm -hmm. who's now on her, her big book tour, right? Um, you know, but by the way, her voice is so, so crucial, right? Yes. What, what democratic theorists will tell you is that the people who are the, the elites of the party are supposed to be the gatekeepers of the party. They're supposed to keep out the fascists. They're supposed to keep out the authoritarians. And so people like Liz Cheney tried. Um, it is really disheartening that she was pushed out, but here we are. Um, <clears throat> but if you notice what the January 6th committee did was they made a concerted effort to create a distinction between the folks in the Trump administration who were orchestrating all of these lies and the regular folks who showed up in Washington that day. They also made a distinction between the sort of fascist militia groups 
who had, you know, all kinds of intentions to do terrible things that day, and they separated them from the regular folks who just went to the rally on the Oval that day. And the reason that that's important is that it allows, what you cannot do is threaten people's face. You need to allow people to save face. And, mm. and if folks really felt like they were on the side of what was good and right, mm. to be able to approach them respectfully and show them information, or, or not even information, but connect with them as human beings first, that is what's gonna bring them back into the fold. When it comes to how do we get people to understand that especially the recent statements of folks like, like someone like Donald Trump are clearly um, emblematic of authoritarianism. I think in order for people to hear that, if they are already sort of leaning to the right, the, the trouble is conservatism is not the problem. The Republican Party is not the problem. The MAGA authoritarian propensity is the problem. The undermining of democratic institutions is the problem. And I think that we get in a real pickle when we conflate ideology with, like political ideology, with authoritarianism, which is a style, right? So we, we, you have to be really careful. I, I saw folks saying um, something like, or criticizing the idea that Nikki Haley would be less dangerous to democracy than Trump. And saying, well, because Nikki Haley also has these extremely conservative views. I'm like, that's completely different from being an authoritarian. Having a candidate who has very culturally conservative views, like, that's called politics as usual. If they respect the institutions and they respect the processes and they are not looking to weaponize the Justice Department against their political enemies. That's what we want, mm -hmm. right? So I think having those conversations and being open to that distinction is gonna be important. And will allow people to think in ways that separate political ideology from this question about authoritarianism. Thank you. Can we give? Thanks. Anna. You have my mind percolating here. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dana. Thank you so much.